Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. On this week's show, I chat with Sumi Connock, creative director of formats at BBC Studios, and Katie Bailey, the new CEO of Women in Film and TV, the membership organisation for women working in media. And we welcome back Richard Middleton, editor of Television Business International, as he updates us on the latest senior TV executive moves in Movers and Shakers. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. Don't forget to sign up for our new weekly newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. And why not follow us and say hi on LinkedIn, Instagram, where we're telecast underscore TV, and Twitter. So this week, my first guests are Women in Film and TV's new CEO, Katie Bailiff, and Creative Director of Formats at BBC Studios, Sumi Connock. Welcome to the show, Katie and Sumi. Hi, thanks for having us. Hello. Thanks for coming on. Katie, let's start with you. You've just started your new role as CEO of Women and Film in Television. Can you tell us a bit about your background? I grew up in the northern seaside resort of Morecambe, Uh, went to the local comprehensive and didn't know anybody that worked in the media when I was growing up. All my friends' parents had proper jobs, I guess. They were farmers or fishermen, teachers and nurses. So I didn't really, it wasn't on my radar at all uh, as an option, as a career option. But when I was 16, LWT came to film an episode of Poirot at the Art Deco Hotel, uh, Midland Hotel in Morecambe, which overlooks the incredible bay there. And a props woman called at our house. She was trying to source a traditional boat for the set. And as my dad was the local boat builder, she'd been sort of sent in our direction. So we loaded the boat onto the trailer, I remember, and we went, I went along for the ride. And I just remember arriving on the set. It was like a night shoot. um, And the Midland Hotel was beautifully lit with a combination of, I I imagine, a massive rig and a huge full moon. And David Suchet was there in period costume. And there were women being sewn into 1920s kind of silk cocktail gowns. But what I really remember was the atmosphere, the kind of busy chat and the crackle of the walkie-talkies and and the kind of grip and the kit and the clattering and the makeup truck I just remember that really fun Um, and then there was elaborate fruit platters and I'd never seen anything like it and I I just think that that very night I completely fell in love with the idea of working in film and tv and I remember as we towed the boat home my dad must have sort of clocked this kind of vacant look in my in my eyes and he had this expenses envelope that they'd given him and he he kind of gave me a tenner and said find something you love doing and try and get some bugger to pay you to do it (laughs) so (laughs) so so I did (laughs) I went off to York went to uni did one of the very early film and tv courses and then was kind of the northern AP I guess for a while in Leeds and Manchester and kind of uh, Glasgow Liverpool um working out of, uh, of the north um and a director called Brian Hill uh, came up to make a film for uh, Modern Times called Saturday Night, the BBC. And I guess we just sort of clicked immediately. And I think looking back, I, you know, he was from a working class background in Rochdale. And I think our terms of reference, our kind of humour, our shorthand for casting documentaries, it was perfectly aligned. Um, and we just sort of hit it off. We made Drinking for England with the Simon Armitage, who is now the Poet Laureate. Um, and I think that sort of cemented a long-term working relationship. Um, and I moved to London and, and, and I joined Century Films. Um, I was kind of made a partner at Century very early on in my career. And um, we went on to make Feltham Sings, which won a BAFTA. And I think that's when the indie really started to grow. And I've had sort of a, a sort of 20, 25 years at, um, at Century as um, as the partner and creative director. And, um, I, you know, spent years in the heart of British institutions, really prisons and rehabs and schools and hospitals, making documentaries about all sorts of different social issues. And occasionally it was glam. You know, we went on tour with Robbie Williams. I remember for the cinema doc, Nobody Someday, but that was quite rare. Um, and we travelled all over the world. Um, and I don't know, it just became a kind of, I guess a place that filmmakers really respected and wanted to come and, and make docs out of. Um, and, and I think I was really lucky to work with 
some really you know fantastic sort of new talent and talent that went on to be you know commissioners and top directors and running their own indies and I think those early relationships if you kind of invest in people and you kind of back them and effectively track them through their careers I think that sort of that kind of grows um, that kind of um, those relationships. They're kind of long-standing tele relationships, and they're really, you know, they're really important. But I really loved um, working with new directors. I loved the idea of blank sheet of paper and a, and a kind of new person. And I, I worked a lot on those new talent schemes that run out of Channel Four, the First Cut, and the um, the, the BBC First Time Directors Scheme. Um, and and kind of broke a lot of people, I guess, in, into television. Um, and I think, you know, TV is a fantastic industry and it's an industry that affords us great experiences. And I, I kind of think we've got a duty to pass that on to give people breaks and particularly people from underrepresented groups. I think, you know, it's how we get the best telly. I think that's proven now. So I, I, when I was approached about the CEO role at WFTV, I could see that this would be like a really new and exciting opportunity, a challenge for me personally, but also a chance to use all the stuff that I'd kind of learned over the last 20 years of programme making. Um, and I kind of had a chance, if you like, to, to sort of level the playing field. Um, so I jumped at it. <laughs> That's a, a very vivid portrayal of Morecambe. And uh, <laughs> my mind's back to the fruit platters and, the, uh, and David Suchet. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, I know. Well, it's having another moment as well because it, ITV's The Bay is filmed up there um, at the moment. And I think every Wednesday night I kind of sit down and go, oh, that's that alley, that's that bus <laughs> stop. You know, oh, there's one of my dad's boats on yeah. the bay. So it's, it's sort of funny that it's actually, that's the second time in its history, I think, that it's been, you know, been used as a location. Women in film and TV. Can you tell us a little bit about the organisation and what it's set up to achieve? Yeah, so, I mean... In a nutshell, um, Women in Film and Television um, is an organisation, it's a membership organisation that exists to be the voice of women in the media. Um, it's the leading organisation for women working in the media. And it's got a kind of membership made up of all different levels from channel controllers to kind of, uh, you know, to researchers, assistant producers, technical people, um, uh, lawyers, business, right across the sort of landscape of telly, really, we, we've got members from. Um, and as a member, uh, you get exclusive access to the weekly events and networking programme. Um, and the events programme is, you know, is really great. So we've got screenings with Q&As and we do sort of topical panel discussions, masterclasses, upskilling and member meetups. And it's a really sort of busy and diverse events program um, there's four a week and it's the really well attended especially at the moment with them being online and we also put on the legendary WFTV annual award ceremony um, hosted by Sandy Toxvig which is a whole host of brilliant women um, which unsurprisingly sort of sells out in nine minutes apparently and mm -hmm. um, we're currently running a bursary scheme so the, the organization campaigns for women and it runs kind of funding, funded schemes to kind of, you know, develop women throughout their careers. So we've currently got the Pat Llewellyn bursary scheme, which is for lots of 10K development money, which is to give women um, to develop a talent led factual idea. So if you think you've discovered the next Stacey Dooley or Nadia Hussain, Louis Theroux, um, they just kind of, we want 250 words and a bit of filming on your phone to give it, uh, you know, give us the idea of your presenter and then you, you've got the chance to win one of these bursaries. And there's a, you know, there's a great kind of set of industry people that back WFTV. And on that particular committee, there's Jane Root from Utopia, there's Kate Townsend from Netflix, Pat Young. Um, and they're, they're, they'll kind of help you shape your idea and put it in front of the people that you need to get to get the, the idea over the line. Um, what else can I tell you? The mentoring scheme, uh, which is... We run this fantastic uh, mentoring scheme, which is a program designed for women looking to take a kind of significant step in their career. So there's four mid-career mentoring schemes run out of England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And Tracy at Forsyth is the mentoring director who I know you have on the show. Last year there was this creative craft technical and business roles. And the next one starts in March and we'll be giving 40 mid-career women the support to really, I guess, make the next step up um, in their chosen careers. 
Very good. Well, we'll include a link in the episode description to to the bursary. But just looking at women and film and TV as an organisation, what are the key issues for women in the TV industry and film that the organisation is looking to tackle? Well, it's, it's broad, isn't it? But I guess, in a nutshell, equality. And, you know, parity, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, the chance to be given the same opportunities as men, frankly, right across the industry. You know, all genres, on screen, off screen roles. Um, I guess that's it, really. Simple. The pandemic has obviously changed many things uh, in the TV industry, the way that we're working right now. And, you know, we, I talk to guests every week about how how it's affecting their business, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. In terms of the issues that women in film and TV is looking to tackle, are there any that have been more exacerbated by the pandemic? Well, you know, we did a survey uh, before my time at WFTV uh, back in March. Um, The results were pretty shocking. You know, over 90% of the members lost their income. So 39% of women lost their jobs completely. Um, 31% had their current work cancelled and you know the other percentage had their projects paused and and kind of I guess uh, the overall picture you know if you know only 14% of British films are directed by women you know but they make up 50% of film school graduates so you know what's sort of happening uh, along the wayside um and in television the stats are a bit better that 25% of British TV programmes are directed by women. If they are not having any work, if, you know, if, if COVID has impacted women like our members, I think the picture's a little bit better now, and they're only making, you know, 14% or 25% in the first place, then that's, you know, it's pretty obvious that the impact is, 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 gonna, is very, you know, significant um, going forward. Um uh, you know, and it's, it's the freelancers that have been here. And I think a lot of women work in freelance ways. Um, that You know, the, the, it's two-thirds of freelancers have been left with no financial support. So WFTV launched its Forgotten Freelancers campaign. It's sort of continuing to lobby the government on behalf of male and female freelancers who, frankly, have been left a bit high and dry by the government interventions. I wonder if there's any international organisations that are that are similar. The WFTV is an international organisation. Um, WIFTI um, is the eye on the end for international. And most countries have, to a greater or lesser extent, a kind of a similar organisation. And they do all connect up um, at major conferences um, once in a while and, and kind of share stats and figures and incentives and, you know, and, and kind of try and come together, to, you know, to, to kind of address the, the, the bigger picture. Um, But I mean, just going back to the pandemic a bit, I talked about people that aren't working, but I think then you've got the other end of the spectrum where women may be in, uh, you know, broadcaster roles or, you know, staff jobs. Um, You know, they are working and they're working really hard. Um, And they're also probably possibly homeschooling and possibly covering other people's jobs who've been furloughed. So, you know, there's lots of women either worrying about money or kind of (laughs) killing themselves. Um, on a positive note, I think the pandemic, but it's sort of thrown everything up into the air, all the pieces of, hasn't it, of television, how we yeah. work, where we work, who does what. And, you know, telly women are proving themselves, as I always suspected, you know, to be superhuman, versatile, resourceful, flexible. And, you know, maybe we could look at it as a once in a lifetime opportunity for all these pieces when they land, just to land in a slightly different place, you know, just to land so the film and tech TV foundations can be rebuilt and hopefully you know maybe the the inclusion piece just sort of lands slap back in the middle of the new tv landscape um i mean that you know that would be exciting to me (laughs) there's a term that prime minister's been using prime minister of the uk has been using about leveling up so let's hope yeah yeah you know that, that that's one of the positive outcomes of the pandemic that things can be a little bit more equitable when we come out of it sumi coming to you Welcome to the show. You're Creative Director of Formats at BBC Studios. Can you take us through your role briefly and and some of the shows you're responsible for? Yeah, we will do. First of all, I'm loving the fact that this is a totally northern show today. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I also I just wanted to echo what Katie said about that fact that, you know, I've made some of my best friendships through working in TV. We're so lucky to get paid for doing something that we love and, and that whole idea of 
you know, doing as much as we can to help people coming into the industry from different backgrounds. Katie, I don't know if you know, but I've actually been a mentor this year for Women in Film and TV, and it's been so rewarding, such a pleasure to be a part of the scheme. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, oh, I wanted to say thank you. Yeah, I knew that. That was fun. That's fantastic. And well, well, you can speak from the horse's mouth, Sylvie. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. I guess the only downside is I've not yet been able to meet her in person. We are planning to do that once we once lockdown gets lifted. But um, no, it's been been, it's been absolutely brilliant. You're amongst fantastic company. I mean, people, like, you know, you guys, Danny Coworth is a mentor. Fiona Campbell at BBC Three is a mentor. You know, all these people dotted around the industry in you know, all these different, like, you know, power, powerful roles are kind of coming forward and saying, like, what do you want me to do? You know, which is, you know, fantastic. So, yeah, so basically um, my role fundamentally is all about um, working closely with all our creative partners, whether it's in-house or in the indie community, to essentially identify and take the best creative formats to the rest of the world in both the unscripted and the scripted space. Um, so that would be brands like Dancing with the Stars, Weakest Link, Top Gear, Bake Off, um, on the scripted side, it'll be Dr. Foster, Life on Mars, Criminal Justice, The Office. Um, so that's sort of the main part of my role. But also it's about keeping those brands fresh. Um, we'll do um, creative exchanges year round. And also, obviously, in the past 12 months, it's been about keeping those big brands on air during really challenging times and working how best we can do it and sharing innovations knowledge experience challenges you know the highs and lows are you seeing an increase in demand for those familiar big format names as as a result of the pandemic yeah i i think it's safe to say that broadcasters are definitely more risk averse and, and the result of that is that there has been a shift towards increased commissions of those big familiar brands that have got strong track record high rec recognition factor and you know they know that they're going to deliver an audience and I think the reason why um, there's been a shift towards those is first I think whilst it was a bit of a novelty at the beginning the audience sort of quickly tired of anything that felt like it was filmed on zoom and with a big familiar and well-loved brand you just get that sense of normality when everything else is a little bit up in the air. You sort of sit back and think, oh, God, thank God, Bake Off's back. There's a huge feel-good factor. And for that one hour or whatever, um, three hours if you're in France or Germany, <laughs> then, um, you know, you're in that tent and sort of everything's OK in the world. So I think part of it is that sort of sense of, you know, everything's OK, a bit of normality. I'd say that with these big brands comes a huge amount of experience in terms of being able to deliver these shows on a global scale. They've been produced for, you know, years and years. Um, naturally, broadcasters are concerned about just having the confidence in the local producer's ability to deliver if it's if it's a new format. Um, so naturally, you've got a bit more confidence and assurance in production capabilities for a big established brand compared with a newer format. And I think those big brands have been really quick to adapt and work out how they can deliver their shows in a COVID friendly way, but not to the detriment of the format on screen. So, you know, we saw I'm a Celebrity in the UK shooting in a castle in Wales. The Voice have got their virtual audience on Dancing with the Stars in the US. We remove the audience completely sort of packed it full of lighting and, and, and with all the training that was all filmed remotely so no one was going into contact with the couples. Um, so I think that has been um, a big part of it as well, that sort of assurance of being able to deliver with those big brands. And I also think co-viewing is, is a big factor. People have obviously have been consuming a lot more content recently because they're basically not leaving the house in a lot of countries. Um, so there's more time that's spent at home. And if you're sitting on your own in your room at work all day, I think there's a tendency to come together as a family at the end of the day. So that broad appeal of those sort of goes, it kind of goes hand in hand with those big familiar brands. Um, so, you know, Masked Singer, obviously slightly newer um, in terms of global formats, but has got that cross-generational appeal. Um, same, same appeal of shows like Dancing with the Stars and The Voice. Um, so you all kind of want to sit down together, have a little bit of joy, enjoy it together. Um, and then finally, I think with the big brands, the other big area has been um, 
a particular demand for game show. Um, and there's kind of been a return for a number of big evergreen formats in that genre, like Millionaire, Weakest Link. I think our, our US, we relaunched um, Weakest Link in the US on NBC last September, and it got the highest rated premiere launch in two years. Um, and I think obviously that beauty of the game show is that you can film it in volume. It can be a really quick turnaround from green light to screen, slightly easier to film in a COVID friendly way, which all those are big ticks at a time when we know that broadcasters have got an urgent need to fill slots. Um, plus, you can take one of those big game shows, bring a great piece of casting to it. We put Jane Lynch um, on Weakest Link in the US. And it feels as fresh as it did 20 years ago. Plus, there's a whole audience who've just never even seen it first time around. So those sort of golden greats of game show, Millionaire, Family Feud, Match Game, all completely stand the test of time um, as much as they did first time around. And they're just a bit of fun, aren't they? Game show is fun, uh, escapist, play along, not too much sort of um, purpose and seriousness about them. Yeah, and quiz shows actually, and quizzes, Zoom quiz, you know, was was a really big feature of lockdown one. Actually, I seem to remember that everybody seemed to be doing a Zoom quiz. We don't seem to have many recently, but you're right; those sort of familiar formats are obviously seem to have captured the imagination again. Just a point that you made about changes and tweaks in formats when it comes to producing in COVID conditions. What's the process of, of changing a show? I mean, uh, obviously, we're not talking about a fundamental change, but because obviously when you put a format together, you have a Bible and this is how you make it and you're not allowed to change it. But presumably, this is the first time that anybody's really needed to consider making quite significant changes to an established format. What's the process of changing it to work within COVID conditions? Obviously, you've got the formats that are wholly owned by BBC Studios, and then you've got um, third-party um, formats. Um, if it's a third-party format, then we will, you know, consult with them. We'll talk with them. I think right from the beginning, you know, when when the um, pandemic, you know, we started to see the spread of, of COVID, um, it was really interesting to watch it because, because you know, we had I think we had about ten different versions of Dancing with the Stars on air the first six months of last year. So that was sort of having to learn, adapt, share that knowledge as, you know, week to week, basically. We we kind of had, we were creating big Google Docs, gathering in all the information. So using our um, international production consultants, using our produ- wholly owned production companies on the ground, just a lot of talking to each other, finding out who was doing what, sharing that information. People did it in different ways. There were different approaches. There was obviously different government restrictions depending on the different territories. So there was a lot to take on board and there were different approaches. You know, we, with if I take dancing with an example, you'd have um, some countries where you completely bubble the couples so they are completely separate and there's total social distancing and there's no audience in the studio on Bake Off in the UK they totally bubbled that production so everybody went on site and they filmed it over a shorter period of time but nobody came in and out Um, same as they would have done with Love Island when they did it in Vegas in in, in the US but other territories with Bake Off just did social distancing you know there were screens there were masks it was a lot of um flying by the seat of our pants, but sharing all the knowledge as much as we could and being really, really collaborative and really fast moving um, because it was really important to keep those brands on air. I think for a lot of reasons, obviously there's the business reason, but I think when, when, like I was saying earlier, when those big shows do come back, there is that sense of relief and and that bit of normality and, and, and that's what the audience want when everything else is a bit more unknown. What are the newer formats that you've had success with recently? And what would you say the reason is for their appeal? So I'd say on the unscripted side, um, one of our most recent hits is a show called Stand The Stand Up Sketch Show from the guys at Spirit Studios. So this week, their third season started in the UK. And we did a local version in Sweden for SVT that aired early this year. So, so this show is... Um, Basically, comedians are obviously limited in the moment in terms of 
being able to get out and about, do stand-up gigs and tours. So Stand-Up Sketch Show is a brilliant way to bring stand-up to the viewers without them having to leave their homes and in a really unique way. I'm not sure you've seen it, but basically you have a selection of comics doing stand-up um, across the across the hour. But as they start their, um, you know, funny anecdote, we then go to a reconstruction of how that story played out. Um, so using comedic actors, using the comedians. So it's a really fresh and, and different, um, most importantly, funny way of doing stand-up, which did exist pre-COVID, but, um, but it has been able to be produced during COVID times and, and just tip that... Um, stand-up comedy box when people can't get out and about and uh, and see it in real life um so that's been yeah that's been um, a really nice new um hit in the unscripted space but our really big growth area has been in scripted formats as a result of covid obviously a lot of broadcasters moved their dramas up earlier in their schedule to fill the gaps and in effect that lengthened the gap for, for when they can get their brand new dramas on air and the beauty, of course, the scripted formats is the turnaround time. And we all know how long it takes to get. You've got an original drama off the ground, um, but with a scripted format, it's already been through that long process of developing, writing, honing the characters in the story. The heart of all our dramas are sort of big, bold characters, stories that have got universal appeal, whether it's infidelity, a woman scorned in Dr. Foster, or a man accused of a crime he didn't commit in criminal justice. We've sort of got that track record of having worked with world-class writers and producers and it already have, have gone through that filter. So you end up with a product that's got an incredible pedigree that can be can then be taken and localised at a pretty fast pace. So I think a scripted format can really help broadcasters fill some of their drama needs in a much shorter time frame. And the successes we've had in that area have been Dr Foster. We've, we've done France, India, Russia, Turkey, South Korea, where it was the, I think it was the highest rating cable drama of all time in South Korea. Pretty great when it's a, an adaptation, essentially. Um, to, in Turkey, it was the channel's number one show in the past five years. And then our other huge success um, in scripted formats is The Office. And um, just sort of going back to your question of universal appeal you know we spend half of our lives at work or working even if we're not actually physically at the office at the moment and we've all come across a David Brent somewhere at work and um, <laughs> that sort of concept has traveled incredibly well so we've done 11 territories of that to date um, we did um, India most recently and I think just sort of the nature of where we're at at the moment that desire to have a little bit of fun in our lives I think we're going to see a growth in scripted comedic you know comedy formats over the next 12 months we're already doing local adaptations of Miranda in the US this country and ghosts so yeah that, that's, that's been our biggest growth area recently you, you know obviously the office in the UK was just two seasons and when it went to the US you know they did hundreds of episodes and so with that we now have 200 scripts which makes it really really attractive adaptation for those territories that want to do huge volume which is really important for quite a lot of customers and especially those that you know want to um have that nice binge viewing factor on their um, platforms being a sitcom i mean it's it's actually quite contained as well isn't it so again there's a covid friendly element to it because it's a relatively small cast not many stories that take place outside the actual office itself yeah, exactly. It's been um, it, 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 it's it's very contained, and actually, similarly with this country, it's a it's a small cast of characters. You know, by nature of the title, you are out in the open air, and and most scenes are you know two three people within them. So it makes it a great one to be able to film. You know, when you've got restrictions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I didn't realise that it had been remade in so many territories. So congratulations on that. We've seen baking and ice dancing sparking huge format hits. How can you tell what pursuits, if you like, will resonate with people around the world? How, how can you tell that, that ice dancing is going to be just, you know, so massive and baking? How can you tell them what's next? 
if we knew what's next, we'd all be very, very rich indeed. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the truth is, you know, you can't possibly tell 100% what's going to work and, and what won't. And as a distributor, you obviously ask yourself the usual questions. Is it returnable? Is it talent dependent? Is it scalable? But ultimately, it's about whether you love the creative, whether it feels fresh and different. Can the producers deliver it well for the associated budget? Um, and is the channel, the originating channel, going to look after it? But I think what we have found out in more recent times is that nothing is too niche now. You know, our two biggest formats, you know, baking and ballroom, you'd never have predicted that. More recently, we've seen Lego Masters, Tabra have just done Marble Mania or John de Molson Marble Mania um, in the Netherlands. And I think rather than a particular pursuit, it's about the feel good factor and feel good factual entertainment is definitely stronger than ever. Um, I mean, we saw it with Repair Shop, whose ratings went through the roof at the beginning of the pandemic um, in the UK. And we've seen that we've had the same success with shows like Sewing Bee. I mean, it got over six million when it aired on, I think it was Saturday night over Christmas. I mean, six million people watching Sewing on a Saturday. It kind of makes you question what the world has come to. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, you'd never have thought that. It, it, it's a brilliant show, but you just, you know, nobody would ever have put their money on that. I mean, Pottery. Pottery's doing a great pottery throwdown is doing incredibly well and Bake Off in France has had its best ratings of all time um last year, probably pandemic related. But you know, I think it's I think it's really hard to tell, but it's that feel good factor that is that is resonating so well and and just having an open mind to nothing being too niche. You know, we've seen glass blowing, flower arranging. There was lots of talk about make, do and mend, I think, and return to nature, return to the suburbs. Almost our city centres are, are not really going to have a great deal of uh, appeal for offices anymore. How important is it for you to look at human behaviour and, and societal trends to anticipate what's going to work, what's going to be the next uh, bake-off? Yeah, I mean, that whole idea of sort of escaping into the everyday has become a sort of common theme, hasn't it? Because we can't travel or go on any adventures. So people are definitely turning a bit closer to home. So definitely part of the development process is tapping into those societal trends and looking at what people are doing. And a lot of that is definitely closer to home than it has been in the past. We have got, um, there's a new format from Youngest Media, which is launching in Germany, um, with the working title of Filth, but that basically taps into the trend of clean fluencers. Don't know if you're aware of that. So, you know, people and all their different methods of cleaning, whether it's, you know, what's the best new um, chemical product on the market or can I get my silver clean by using bicarbonate of soda and tin foil, which actually does work very well, by the way. But essentially, it's a competitive cleaning show where you've got four cleaning obsessed strangers who are all using their favourite cleaning hacks um, to try and um, take home the cleaning crown when faced with some pretty disgusting cleaning challenges. That, I would say, is a reflection of, um, you know, what we've been seeing on, on social media recently. And we've got another um, sort of more studio-based comedy entertainment format called Fact or Fake, and that taps more into the fake news phenomenon, but also, you know, our ability to consume those really quick hit viral clips. Um, and the basic premise of that show is that can you have a panel of three comedians who can spot the fakes from the facts when they're presented with a selection of viral videos. So it's just fun, quick hits. Um, they get shown a video, they decide whether it's fact or fake, and then we bring someone into the studio to reveal whether it is true or false. So just fun, fast-paced visual comedy show that taps into another trend. So, yeah, tapping into trends is... Uh, definitely fuels um creativity and one more question for you sumi showcase is coming up very shortly can you give us any clues as to the themes your newer formats will be tackling this year yeah definitely so obviously we're having to have a fully virtual showcase this year so it's all a little bit different but we've got lots of um exciting content being put onto the platform yeah a couple of things we've got we've we've all seen the rise of the guessing game recently 
we've got a brand new format called This Is My House that takes that guessing game concept, but essentially sets it in the real world. It's been commissioned for Primetime BBC One in the UK, and we're really excited about it because it just feels really unique and it's got brilliant play along for the audience. Plus, it's very funny. And essentially, the concept is one contestant, one house, one rule, just be yourself. And it has four four people who are basically all declaring, this is my house. But only one of them is telling the truth. And the other three are actors who are doing their best to convince the viewers and a celebrity panel in the studio that the house and everything in it belongs to them. So it's just really fun, um, really fun play along, um, sort of challenges your prejudices and perceptions and sort of asks the simple question of will the truth win? Um, and also we're all, we're all used to looking. I mean, it's so fascinating when you're on Zooms and you can see everybody's background and we all love snooping around people's houses. So that's one that's coming up. That's This Is My House. And just sort of going back to, we were talking about that rise in the appeal for the game show and a new brand new game show called The 1% Club from Magnum Media, which is slightly different in terms of the fact that it's not about what you learned at school or your ability to memorise facts. It's just all about how your brain works. So an eight-year-old would have as much chance as an 80-year-old um, of winning. So basically, you've got contestants in a studio who were all competing to win a place in the 1% club, which means that you are in the top 1% uh, of the country, an elite group of people who can say that they're smarter than 99% of the population. So because the questions are all kind of like brain, a bit more brain game types of questions, it means that everyone's on a level playing field, which means that anyone can play along. So as we said before, perfect co-viewing um, for the whole family. It's being hosted by Lee Mack in the UK. And I think history shows us that if you've got a simple and compelling game with a brilliantly funny and entertaining host, you can get a really winning combination. So we have got high hopes for that one as well. Now it's time for Story of the Week, where my guests get to highlight the TV industry stories that have caught their eye over the past seven days. Katie, what's your Story of the Week? Well, I enjoyed the story last week of um, the Golden Globes uh, nominating three women for Best Director for the first time in history. So it was a history-making story. So Emerald Fennell, Regina King and Chloe Zaho all received nominations for their films Promising Young Woman, One Night in Miami and Nomadland, respectively. And I guess it's the first time that um, the, the Globes have recognised more than one, one female nominee in that category in the same year, never mind three. Um, so prior to that, um, the, the woman most recently nominated was Ava DuVernay in 2014 for Selma. We had a little whoop around the WFTV office when, uh, when that uh, announcement was made. Great. Well, that's that's great. And also, we've got Oscar nomination week, I think, this week. We get to find out what the shortlists are. So uh, so fingers crossed there as well. Sumi, what's your story of the week? Well, I was really interested to see the attention that the Australian version of Married at First Sight is getting in the UK because it has had a huge amount of chatter on social. Also, stories coming into the UK press, which is pretty unprecedented for an international adaptation of a format. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think it's the first time that an international adaptation has come back into the UK and captured people's attentions in the same way. In terms of reasons why, I think it's quite interesting. Is it due to lockdown? Is it down to the fact it's all available on all four so they can binge watch it? Is it because we are more open to consuming content from other countries because Netflix and the streamers have made the world feel like a much smaller place? But I think what we can definitely conclude is that no one does stripped reality like Australia does. They've got big hooks, big drama, really compelling viewing. And Australia in general have got um, you know a brilliant track record in terms of ramping up existing formats, taking them to the next level. If you think about MasterChef, they did that back in the day. Um, we saw it more recently with Lego Masters, which I think was instrumental in, in Fox taking it on in the US. So, yeah, I mean, it shows how imported formats and content can find an audience if the content is compelling enough. So that is my story. And now it's time for my guests to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Sumi, who's your hero of the week? 
So my hero is not someone from the TV or media industry, but certainly one of the most watched pieces of content over the past few days, because my hero is Jackie Weaver from the Handforth Parish Council meeting. I mean, I love the whole thing, but um, her no-nonsense approach um, and reaction to some extremely bad behaviour um, was just brilliant to watch. I think it kind of, I mean, it was like a sitcom. You literally couldn't write it. Julie's iPad, I think, was my favourite character of the whole film. There was there was the back of Barry Burkill's head. You know, I think it just sort of captivated the frustrations of lockdown, coping with the pressures of working from home, being on endless Teams and Zoom meetings. And I just thought she handled it brilliant. And the crazy part is she's not even part of Handforth Parish Council. She was actually bought in to provide advice and guidance and support because they'd had problems at their meetings. So, yes, she's my favourite. And also it all happened 10 minutes away from my house. I'm hoping to bump into Jackie Weaver on my next trip. And you're going to have to tell her that she has absolutely no authority at all. I mean, absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who haven't seen this, maybe internationally it hasn't hasn't reached them yet, but uh, I'm surprised if it hasn't. But this is a viral video of a parish council meeting via Zoom that went viral over the last few days. And it, it was, yeah, just a lovely slice of Little England Zoom lockdown. Just it, it, And it was a, almost like a beautifully scripted, mini comedy we'll put a uh, a link to that in the description as well katie how about you who's your hero of the week oh well i love jackie weaver as well and i i think it's almost like she's going to become a sort of verb you know i'm gonna to have to jackie weave you there you know um i think that um i've filmed in loads of council meetings over the years and and board meetings at various institutions and like the jackie weaver is much needed in on many of those occasions and i, I thought she was great but I, the one that i chose um is it's is kind of, a, of an antidote to that, to the, the idea of, you know, we're all trapped in houses on Zoom calls with kind of people and children and work all around us. Um, and I really loved um, a story last week uh, in the press that uh, Gothenburg Film Festival had um, launched a competition to give a movie fan the opportunity to spend a week watching its um, its offerings on an isolated lighthouse island it's just complete I think it was a moment I was having I just thought that is my heaven so they picked a nurse a Swedish nurse she was the chosen one from 12,000 applicants to attend the festival on her own um and she's been there a week um and she is on the island uh, the remote island of Hammondskar and she says it's a dream she's um uh, she's video day detailing her experience um but she's been she, she's just like in bed looking out at the sea in a lighthouse, watching the um, Gothenburg Film Festival programme. Is it just me or is that heaven? I think that's fantastic. I mean, it's uh, we're all in isolation, but that's sort of taking it to the extreme, isn't it? Back-to-back sort of uh, film festival on the, in that sort of location sounds, uh, sounds fantastic. And what's going in your bin, Katie? Oh, what's going in my bin? OK, so this is quite personal to me. Um uh, you know, and I know that everybody has got their own particular blend of worries at the moment. But I've, I've kind of juggled a career and two small kids um, over the last 10 years without too much mum working guilt. I kind of, you know, my kids know that I love my job. You know, they clap when they see my name on the telly. And generally, they happily accept that, you know, I'm on a shoot generally means someone else will be putting them to bed. Um, so in truth, I haven't really suffered any major kind of guilt thus far in my presenting uh, parenting journey. But I think lockdown three is a game changer. And I think if you ask anyone in telly or in any other demanding career who's currently trying to either look after little ones, homeschool and full work full time, checking on way- wayward ageing parents, how they feel, after after almost a year of this shit show, I think they'll inevitably tell you they are surviving, but they are riddled with guilt, mum guilt, off the scale, uh, guilt they're neglecting their kids or their jobs or their partners or their parents or all of the above. And I hadn't personally realised how exhausting kind of mum guilt can be. So if you'll grant me permission, Justin, I'd personally like to put mum guilt well and truly in the bin on behalf of everybody. Um, but I just asked that someone else puts the bin out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, let's let's all agree with that and chuck that in, in the bin. Sue me, what's going in your bin? 
going in my bin is a continuation of the Jackie Weaver theme, which is I'm putting Alid's iPad in the bin. <laughs> um, because um, there were elements of Michael Douglas in Falling Down going on there. Um, I think it kind of took Zoom fatigue and the highs and lows of working from home to another level altogether. So yeah, it was it was it was not nice to watch. But I think on a serious note, what I would take from that is it is just and I don't mean to preach to people, but it is just so important to get out every day if you can. Go for a walk, get some fresh air, do some of Tracy Forsyth's lovely meditation or yoga. I mean, do whatever it takes that you don't feel yourself getting to that level that you need to scream at the top of your voice at a poor innocent lady. But yeah, so for that reason, Alid's iPad is going in the bed. Alid's <laughs> iPad. Sumi, Katie, thank you so much for joining me this week. Really enjoyed having you on telecast. Hope we'll see each other in the flesh very soon. Good luck with Women and Film and TV and good luck with BBC Showcase. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. It's been a while since we've caught up with TBI's editor Richard Middleton to discuss the latest senior TV industry executive moves in Movers and Shakers. Hi, Richard. How's it going over there? It's good, thank you, Justin. Lovely to be back. Yeah, we've got a few snow flurries outside, but uh, inside the office at TBI Towers, it's uh, all good. Uh, my home office, at least. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, what have you been covering in TBI recently? It, well, it was a very busy January last month. We had all of the uh, the NAP P and real screen events online, obviously. So we were trying to cover as much of that as possible. We we're also putting together uh, a digital version of the magazine for London screening. So we've got loads of UK sort of focused stuff. Uh, in that, so we've got all the, lots of data, lots of features, not just obviously on the UK, but looking at sort of how the UK is working with the world, which is uh, obviously an increasingly uh, vital part of the business for, for UK-based companies, um, and, and lots of stuff coming up around London screenings. The, uh, we've got TBI Talks with three sessions planned for that, just ahead of uh, just before the London Screenings Week starts at the start of March, uh, and yeah, this digital magazine as well, so busy times. For those who don't know, London Screenings is a fairly recent addition to the TV industry calendar, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's it's a really interesting one, Justin. So it's kind of based off the fact that BBC Studios uh, normally has a big event up in Liverpool called Showcase, and that attracts sort of 700, 800 buyers into the UK ordinarily. Um, obviously, this year is somewhat different, but it's developed over the, yeah, the last three or four years uh, with quite canny U- London-based distributors, you know, all three media internationals, ITV Studios, that type of company, thinking that they'll pick up a few of these buyers that are flying in for BBC Studios event uh, and holding their own events. So we've had screenings. Last year, we had lots of screenings, drinks, networking events, that type of thing um, down in London. Uh, to catch some of those buyers, and it, it's really developed quite quickly. This year, we've had the the big um, distributors, the big London-based distributors. So we've got yeah, your, your Fremantles, your All Three Media Internationals, your ITV Studios coming together, um, and Banijo obviously as well, Banijo Rights, all coming together to to create a, a schedule at least. Let's put it like that, um, so that they their events don't overlap. What will be interesting is how that develops next year. Uh, and the next couple of years, probably, to see if they sort of put that, you know, that relationship on, on making sure that their events don't overlap. If they put that relationship uh, any deeper, and um, and perhaps in launch some kind of joint event or something like that, it would be, yeah, very interesting development for um, for the UK business, but also for the international and European business as well. Going on to movers and shakers, which executive moves have caught your eye recently? There's been some really interesting stuff. I mean, back in the last year, we saw you know, some huge changes over at the US studios. And, and to be honest with you, some of it uh, is still happening. Um, a lot of it is because of this sort of wholesale shift in the way that the US studios and, and increasingly uh, companies around the world are, are aligning their operations, which is essentially to bring together streaming operations uh, and, and sort of legacy businesses such as linear networks. Uh, and bring those teams together. So we back in the last week, we had some some big news out of NBC Universal. Susan Rovner, who's the Warner Bros. Um, exec who joined NBC Universal to become chairman of entertainment last year, she made a, a few appointments at the back end of last year. And, and basically underneath her, there's now a whole gamut of people who are overseeing um, NBC Universal's uh, commissioning, essentially, and, and its production. This is all to do with sort of merging TV and streaming divisions. So 
Unfortunately, there have been layoffs. There's rumours, the latest uh, sort of layoff number is around 50 people being uh, being cut. Um, but we've had quite a few execs uh, put in place as well. Back end of last year, we heard that Lisa Katz was becoming president of Scripted um, under Rovner's entertainment division. Um, and we had Rod Acer and Jenny Groom uh, heading up Unscripted. And now we've seen the team, basically, that's underneath her. So we've got people like Cara Delaverson and Alex Sepiel uh, being named EVPs of drama series. Uh, we've got um, Jeff Mayerson, who's become EVP of comedy series. Uh, and we've got Michael Schlusen, who's become EVP of current series and co-productions. Um, on the unscripted side, we've got uh, execs like former CBS uh, exec Shan Vong. She's become SVP of unscripted development. Um, and Shelby Shaftel becomes... SVP of unscripted programming. So there's a lot of SVPs, EVPs, that type of thing. But I think the underlying sort of shift here and thing to really sort of take note of, to be honest, is the fact that, you know, this is uh, more turbulence, more job cuts, unfortunately, um, as Mark Lazarus sort of revamps the entire operations over at NBCU. We're hearing that this is the last sort of major changes that we're going to see from NBCU at the moment. Um, but what it means essentially is that if you're pitching to to NBCU and that content now is going to be you know it's going to go across it's going to have teams that work on Peacock it's it's broadcast network NBC and all of the cable nets that come underneath it so Oxygen USA Sci-Fi Bravo E you know all of these divisions are going to work um, within a centralised division and and you've got yeah, a team now put in place uh, that's going to oversee all of that business. Okay, so it's a, basically a centralised content division, if you like, overseeing all of these channels and networks and, and the streaming service. It's uh, Yeah, it's cost-cutting and, and, I mean, you know, last year, we, we obviously we had the pandemic, but we, the, the real, you know, the major shift was the fact that all of these you know, studios transformed the way that they're doing business um, and, and streaming is now, uh, yeah, central to to every company's uh, operations out there. Do we know where those job cuts are? Is it mainly in LA? It, I think mainly in LA, yeah. Uh, we've got um, yeah most of them out of LA, out of Hollywood. Um, there are, I think there's you know, admin, backroom staff that have been affected, but also yeah, people on the commissioning side, on the production side. Um, it's it you know it's essentially sort of streamlining. We're hearing this increasingly. We've had you know, Netflix streamlining its team, but now we're getting, you know, we've had, we've had the streamlining over at the studios as well. And it's, yeah, a reflection on the way that the business has changed and in, increasingly vertically integrated, essentially, um, where you don't need multiple teams to look after networks um, and streaming. You just have one team uh, and it commissions across the whole, uh, the whole gamut. And we've seen that, you know, we've seen that at BBC in the UK now as well. And, uh, and we've seen some changes over at Disney as well. Yeah, the Mouse House has been busy. Um, this is, a, I mean, a fairly straightforward one. But Rob Mills, um, who's been with with D- the yeah with Disney for a long, long time, I think since two thousand and three. Um, so he was previously SVP of Alternative ABC Entertainment, and again, it's a very similar story. So he's now uh, been promoted. So he's going to uh, lead the the new production division at Walt Disney Television Alter- Alternative. Uh, so essentially what that means is he's going to be developing sh- unscripted shows for ABC, but also its US-focused uh, streamer Hulu. Um, so again, it's it, you know it's all about this, you know, there's this integration between uh, what's happening on the linear side uh, and what's happening on the OTT side. And uh, and how about Canada? Now, we, we're always talking about the US and we're, we're often talking about the UK. Canada is a territory that we haven't covered off in great detail so far on telecast. There's obviously been some big moves in the industry over there in terms of senior execs. In, yeah, there has. It's really interesting to sort of see how this, you know, what we, we were seeing last year, this, uh, this yeah, as I say, sort of streamlining at the studios is now it's spreading around the world. Uh, as I said, we, we had it over at the BBC. ITV's in the UK has changed it the way it operates as well. This uh, just past January, we've seen similar changes up at Bell Media in Canada. Um, so last week we had two hundred odd jobs going in, uh, in across people on camera, people off camera. Um, there were you know, various senior execs going. Robin Johnston, director of original production, factual and reality, uh, was reportedly among those departing. Um, and again, it's to do with yeah, just this streamlining, basically focusing on 
on streaming um, without wanting to repeat myself. Uh, and I mean, the interesting thing about Bell is they've got a new boss, Wade Oosterman, uh, who was brought in last year to replace Randy Lennox. He kicked everything off at the start of the year with some fairly uh, monumental changes. You know, long-standing execs, Mike Cosentino, who was the content chief there, SVP of original programming, Corey Coe departed. Uh, we saw Nancy McLean, who headed up VP, or she was VP of Bell Media Studios. She went... Um, and this was all because Bell Media, it's got its own streamer called Crave TV, and it's looking to put more focus on that. And it's facing huge competition from Netflix uh, and from some of the other streamers. Instead of focusing purely on, on net networks, which is its CTV branded channels, and, and it does, it, you know, it's got a, a relationships with sort of 30 specialist networks with partners such as Discovery and, and Comedy Central, it's looking to focus much more on Crave TV, that direct to consumer approach. Um, and as a result, it's completely revolutionised the way it's it's working. Those three stories there, they, they all tell a bigger story, a wider story, don't they, of the industry that I'm sure is going to be a trend we're going to be seeing more and more often, those sort of announcements coming out over the year. So, Richard, thank you so much for spending your time with us on Movers and Shakers again this month. All the best to you. Speak to you very soon. Lovely to be on. Thanks, Justin. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. At the end of episode 45, it's amazing how quickly we've got to nearly a year of telecasts. Thanks for listening to this show and to all the previous shows so far. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our new free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed, Exclusive insight and opinion, including the secret producer, our intrepid, anonymous exec reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Lockdown 3 in London. So, until next Thursday... As always, stay safe.